page 711. Oh, I need to remind myself. Here, um, That's not enough time. Um, stairs of Kirith on Gaul, pages 710, 711 is where we are picking up. Okay. So we left off the other day at the crossroads where they saw the fallen statue, the sun shines down the, the broad avenue and hits the head of the fallen statue and Frodo makes the comment, you know, they cannot win forever and then it gets pitch black. They start the way up um, this hidden passage, so to speak, okay? And we're told, or we get told... Might have actually been in the chapter with, yeah, it's the chapter with um, Faramir. Yeah, for just one second. Page 692. Faramir mentions this, you know, place, Kirith Ungol. He says, if Kirith Ungol is named, old men and masters of war will blanch and fall silent. And then he talks about the Valley of Minas Morgul and such, okay? So they're making their way up this Kirith Ungol passage. And page 711 is where I want to pick up, okay? They pause, they stop for a while, and Sam asks, I wonder when we'll find water again. But I suppose even over there they drink. Orcs drink, don't they? That is over there, he's talking about once we get into Mordor itself. Frodo, yeah, they drink, but uh, let's not talk about that. In other words, I don't want to drink what orcs drink. I mean, that's just disgusting. Sam, all the more need to fill our bottles. That is, we got to find water before we get into Mordor itself if we're not going to drink the water of Mordor. But there isn't any water up here, not a sound or a trickle. And Fearmere said we can't drink anything that's in the Morgul Vale. Frodo. No, nope, no water flowing out of Imled Morgul. Those were his words. We're not in that valley now. If we came on a spring here, he says it would be flowing into it, not out of it. Sam, I, I still wouldn't trust it. Something wicked about this place. In other words, he's got the heebie-jeebies. He doesn't know why, but something bothers him. Frodo, I don't like anything here at all. Step or stone, breath or bone. Earth air and water all seem accursed. But so our path is laid. But so our path is laid. Now, you might remember, or you might not, how did Frodo ask Gollum what their path was when they got to the beginning of the Dead Marshes. He says, how will we shape our path? How will we shape our path? What does that imply? They don't know where they're going yet. Okay, they don't know where they're going yet. What else? Won't be straight. Won't be straight necessarily. What else? Louder? It's predetermined at this moment. Is it? In, in the previous part? No. Well, if it's the path. In this, it is predetermined. Back earlier, who's who's doing the shaping? We are. Okay. How do we shape our path? That is, how do we make our way forward? Notice the difference. Our path is laid. That is, we don't have any choice anymore, Sam. We don't get to turn right. We don't get to turn left. Well, why? Okay, earlier he asked Gollum, how do we shape our course? How do we pick our way through? Well, where are they essentially? What is, what is this thing that they are in? It's a big, long tunnel. How do you get through it? You either keep going or you turn around. 
There, there's no other choice. So our path is laid. Sam. Yes, that's so. You're right, Mr. Frodo, you're right. And we shouldn't be at our here at all if we'd known more about it before we started. What's he mean? What time of year is it, by the way? Anybody know? Month? It's March. When do they start? In September. They left on Frodo's birthday. September 22nd. Left on Frodo's birthday. So, a lot of time's gone by. When he says, we shouldn't be here at all if we'd known more about it before he started, what's he really mean? Sitting back there in your house in September, if you'd have told me then, I'd be here right now being led by Gollum into Satan's backyard. Hell no, I wouldn't be here. I would have said, no, Mr. Gandalf, I don't want to see elves. <laughs> but I suppose it's often that way. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr. Fredo, adventures as I used to call them. <coughs> okay, so what has Sam just said about what they are in? He hasn't stated it explicitly. He's implied it. We're in a tale. Because he says, it's often that way. What is the brave things in the old tales and songs? He's saying we're like people in a tale or song. Remember what Aragorn had to say to Aomer and the other writers of the Rohirrim? When they suddenly spring up out of the grass, you know, they talk about, Aramir and, and the others talk about legends and old wives' tales. Because right? they're talking about Galadriel and stuff. And Aragorn's like, legend? The king? Sword that was broken? Legendary. Halflings? Legendary. But then what else does he say? You, Aramir. Are legendary also. How so? And we could extrapolate. We could say, you are legendary. How so? Because legends aren't about the time in which the action occurs, right? Legends are always about a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, once upon a time. They're always in the past. Why? Because it's deeds that are done that get told about, that become the legends of the future. Back to Sam. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo's adventures, as I used to call them. I used to think, used to think, doesn't anymore, that they were things the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for. Because they wanted them, because they were exciting, and life was a bit dull. Kind of a sport, you might say. In other words, most people in these old tales, Sam thought, <coughs> were sitting around home one day, and they thought, man, life's boring. Let's go do something. Let's go have some fun. And that fun becomes this great heroic tale. You know, Like, the character Beowulf is just sitting up there in Geekland one day, and he's like, I'm bored. We're going to see later on another set of novels. A group of people are going to be sitting around one late spring afternoon after taking exams. And one of them's going to say, I'm bored. And in comes Severus Snape. And he becomes the object of alleviating their boredom. And we'll talk about that. Okay? So Sam says these, these great characters in these old tales, he used to think they were just bored with life. And so they went off and did some great adventure. But that's not the way of it with the tales that really mattered or the ones that stay in the mind. Folks seem to have been just landed in them usually. Their paths were laid that way, as you put it. See, it's Frodo saying, so our path is laid that launches this reverie 
in Sam's mind that launches this, this you know, spate of literary criticism, but it's literary slash life criticism that Sam really starts to think about. Notice, they were just landed in them. <coughs> how many of the people, how many of the firemen, you think who woke up on 9-11, 2001, thought, man, I wish we'd get a good call today. Life just, you know, it's been boring around the house lately, the firehouse. I wish we'd get some good, some good fire, some good rescue. I don't think so. They just got landed in that event. I doubt that Todd Beamer and the other guys on flight 93, I think it was, the one that was headed back to Washington, I doubt when they got on that plane that morning, you know, that they were really thinking, oh, I want to go do something great. But when they realized what was happening and his wife and other people's spouses and people on the phones heard, let's roll, they knew at that point, not coming back. They just found their path laid that way. Talk about finding themselves in a legend. And if they had, let me back up. Usually their paths were laid that way. But I expect they had lots of chances, like us, of turning back. Yes? So um, what about the, the song that like mentions the halflings, um, that Frodo points out to Faramir? What about that song? Well, wasn't that a foretelling? Is it? Is there a prophecy? See, this is really interesting. And this is one of the things that connects the Lord of the Rings books with the J.K. Rowling books. Because the J.K. Rowling books have a couple of prophecies. Question, whenever you have a quote-unquote prophetic statement, what question do you always have to ask? Especially in something like this, and in the J.K. Rowling books, where you don't get that prophetic statement prefaced like you often do in the Old Testament. See, in the Old Testament, in most of the prophets, the prophetic statement is prefaced with what? With what? Thus saith the Lord. It comes from God. Where did the vision, where did the dream that Faramir actually had first and then it came to Lord there. Where did the dream come from? Do, 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 do. Nobody knows. Where did the prophecy in the Harry Potter novels come from? It came through Sybil Trelawney. Didn't come from her. Yes? Isn't it like, like with Aragorn's meeting the great company, there's like a prophecy that he mentions and it's like, there, there is a statement there where Aragorn is reminded by one of the Dunedin, one of the great company, and the person says, you know, Arwen essentially wants you to remember, and there it's another old prophecy, but, but that one has an origin, and the, the origin is pretty clear, and it, it's specifically why Aragorn has to go through the paths of the dead. That is, something happened in the past that hasn't been completed. And the people who didn't complete this thing in the past, they're still bound until they complete it. So that one has a beginning and an end point. All right? But, you know, the pro those words that are attributed to Aragorn's name, that Bilbo kind of thinks he creates, new. <laughs> Gandalf makes it clear. Aragorn makes it clear. Those words, that all that wander are not lost, all that glitters is not gold. He says, those go with the name. So that when his father, Arathorn, names him Aragorn, it's almost like, and with that name comes this little packet. This, this little poem that comes with it. Well, the little poem is what's telling us. He will be the future king. But only what? If all these other dominoes fall into place. See, we're, we don't know that Aragorn's going to become king. We don't know, give something away, Aragorn is going to marry Arwen. He wants to. That's pretty clear. He's got Arwen's agreement. He's got Elrond's agreement. But, when what's the but? What has to happen first? The ring has to be destroyed. 
And? <laughs> Two biggies. Yes, you can marry my daughter, but you got to defeat Satan and be crowned king of the world. <laughs> Little things, you know. It's not like, do you have a good job? <laughs> Will you be a good husband, you know? Little, which, by the way, parallels exactly what Aragorn's great, 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 ancestor, Baron, had to do to marry Luthien. Only there he had to steal the Silmaril from the crown of Morgoth, who is Satan. I mean, he's the real Satan character, literally the Satan character. He has to steal the Silmaril from his crown, and he has to deliver it in his hand to Luthien's father. And he's like, man, you elves, you sell your daughters cheap. <laughs> That's it? That's all you want? No problem. <laughs> We can talk about it later, maybe. So, and one of the reasons I brought that up, because Sam's going to realize in just a moment, oh my God, we're in the same story. This is the story of Baron and Luthien. It's just chapter 856. So, he says, I expect they had lots of chances like us of turning back. Only they didn't. You know, use the Todd Beamer Flight 93 kind of thing. Did they have chances of turning back? There were some people who were supposed to be on that flight who didn't get on that flight. Just like the other flights. There were people who missed their connections. People whose cab was running late. They didn't get on the flight. Now, notice, that's not an intentional turning back. That's a little bit different than what Sam's talking about. Where did Sam have an opportunity to turn back? Galadriel. Galadriel? Louder? Rivendell. Rivendell? Elrond? Keep going. Keep going. When, when really is the first opportunity? Back in the Shire. <laughs> Farmer maggots. I mean, they kind of think for a moment. Hmm. When they get to Buckleberry. Even though when they get to Buckleberry, to Crick Hollow, Frodo's new house that they're moving to, okay? Even there, that's kind of a sham. It's all a ruse to, you know, get them out. But, you know, it, it kind of fat, doesn't have me there for a couple days. I mean, there's a whole bunch of points where you can go, I don't want to go to Rivendell, man. That's long. I'm a hobbit. I like to eat all day. And we're going to lose weight. I mean, we'll skip <laughs> second breakfast. I mean, and third lunch. And... Okay? So he says, they had the option of turning back, but they didn't. And if they had turned back, <coughs> we shouldn't know. Why? Because if they turned back, they'd have been forgotten. See, the reason we know characters like Beowulf is because he does get up and go. And he doesn't get told about how big Grindel is and goes, hell no, I'm not fighting him. <laughs> I'm going back home, because then we would never know. The reason Arthur is so large is because he goes on. The reason Hector, Achilles, Hercules, is because they don't give up. I mean, it's that point Tolkien makes there kind of towards the end of the fairy story essay. They are people who maybe at some point see, I am going to be slaughtered. And they go on. There's a great Old English poem called The Battle of Malden. Okay? It celebrates a real historical battle that occurred in 991. English against the Vikings. Okay? But it was a stupid battle. Utterly asinine on the part of the English. Because the English were woefully outnumbered. According to what we know. And in the battle... The leader, there's a river. In the middle of the river, there's a little island. It's a, it's a um, tidal river, so that when the ocean tide comes in, the river gets high. When the ocean tide goes out, the river gets low. When the tide goes out, you can make your way across from the shore to the island, okay? And the tide goes out. And the Vikings are over here, who outnumber the English. The English are here. The Vikings are here, and they're like, come on, let us fight you. 
And the leader of the English, a guy named Virtov, is a fool because he accepts the challenge. All right, all right, we'll, we'll fight you. Now, when the Vikings come across, they have to come across single file. Now, if the English were smart, what would you do? Kill them one by one. Boom, you just start picking them off, man. <clears throat> okay, he'd be breaking his honor, right? But they fight, and they get slaughtered. And Beardnot, the captain of the forces, who's, we're told, an old grizzled warrior, he dies fairly soon. He gets hacked to pieces. And his men, knowing they're all going to die, they form a shield wall around his hacked up body. And we get this passage towards the end of the poem by this really old grizzled veteran. I mean, this guy's, you know, living in the 1980s and he fought in World War I and World War II in Korea and Vietnam. I mean, he's just battle scarred. And he says, our courage must be the greater, our heart the keener, our minds the stronger as our force lessens. As we get whittled down, He's essentially saying, suck it up, boys. We're going to die. But how are we going to die? Oh, we're going to die well. We're going to die honorably. Tolkien loved that poem. He hated it's too strong. He thought Beertnoth was a fool. He thought Beertnoth's men were honorable. Why? Beertnoth led his men to slaughter. His men died for that's honorable, Tolkien says. The only reason we know about it is because they fought. If they hadn't fought, the poem never would have been written. Okay? So, Sam says, they'd have been forgotten. We hear about those as just went on. And not all to a good end, mind you. What's he mean? Not all to a good end. And they didn't live happily ever after. None of these men live happily ever after. And we even get an account in this of some men who flee. <clears throat> they see their Lord, excuse me, they see their Lord's horse right away. They think the Lord is on it, and they flee. And the narrator of the poem tells us, the persona of the poem tells us, Oh, and they're going to live ignominious lives the rest of their lives. People are going to look down on them. They're going to be outcast because they fled from the scene of battle. Right? Not all to a good end, mind you. At least not to a folk inside a story and not outside it call a good end. What do you mean folk inside the story and not the folk outside the story? Use 9-11. Folk inside the story, 343 firefighters, something like that, versus the folk outside the story. The folk inside the story, what was their end? The firefighters, they died. Inside the story, not to a good end. Why? Because they had lives. They had wives, children, husbands, because they weren't all men. Boyfriends, girlfriends, aunts, uncles, fathers, mothers, and they all, the firefighters, died that day. Their lives didn't go on. Their children's lives, in a sense, didn't go on. They stopped in time, frozen that day. Okay? So we think from within the perspective of their lives, cut short is the kind of language we usually use. But from outside the story, looking back, we say they died how? Heroes. I mean, I get chill books. There we have a talk about that. They died real heroes. Leave them aside. Parkland, Florida, last year, just about this time. You had some crazy blankety blank student go in and start shooting up the place. And while the cops did nothing, who did something? A coach out on the field runs in and students. 
one of the students who was shot and didn't die ran to the door and did this while he was shot five times through the door. Okay. He didn't die. He lived. But he was the one who did what? He didn't run away from the problem. He ran towards the problem. What's Sam's call for those inside the story? What would be considered a good end? You know, coming home and finding things all right. Not quite the same. Notice, like old Mr. Bilbo. Well, what did old Mr. Bilbo find when he came home at the end of The Hobbit? Anybody remember? He might take all his stuff. The SPs were there! The Sackville Magnuses! I noticed, by the way, one of the people on, on replied to my, the lecture where I talked about the S Sackville Magnuses, you know, the SPs and such. You know, actually, Tolkien came up. And it's true, Tolkien came up with Sackville Magnuses for, they're actually for two reasons. One, SP, sons of bitches, because it works. Two, Sackville. It's a French form of Baggins. Sack, sack, you know, bag. Okay? So, that's what Sam says, you know, what you would, within the story, call a good ending. If you were one of those firefighters, because there were some who didn't die, the good, happy ending was they escaped. That is, they saved a lot of people, but they weren't in the towers when they collapsed. And they went home, and they hugged their children, they hugged their spouses, possibly, <laughs> and found things all right, though not quite the same, right? Because nothing's going to be quite the same after that, like old Mr. Bilbo. But those aren't always the best tales to hear, though they may be the best tales to get landed in. That is, if you're going to be in a story, what kind do you want to be in? You want to be in the Disney version, right? Yeah. You do not want to be in the Grimm's fairy tale version. No. Because if you're one of the women in Cinderella no. who wants to put on that glass slipper, oh, man, the first time I read that, that was just so boring. You're cutting your toes off. You're shaving your heel to try to fit into your foot's bleeding. And I, Prince, you know, Prince Charming man, pretty God. <laughs> but I mean, if you gotta. Meme yourself. Sorry, ladies. No guy's worth it, you know. Sorry, man. No woman's worth it either. Either way, okay? Though they may be the best tales to get landed, may not be the, um, those are not the best tales to hear. Though they may, may be the best tales to get landed in. So what's he saying there? What kind of stories do we often like to hear? Tolkien says the highest form of drama, acting, is what? Anybody remember if you read the essay? It's a tragedy. Tragedies are the best plays. Why? They're the ones that get you all worked up. There's a reason why quote unquote action films are so popular. They're the modern version of ancient Greek tragedies. The only thing is they Switch the conclusion so that the conclusion ends with the good guy living. The ancient Greek tragedies, Shakespearean tragedies, the good guys die. Hamlet dies. Lear dies. Othello dies. Othello's yeah, not really a good guy. But, you know. um, Oedipus dies. Oedipus isn't a bad guy. He's mistaken. <laughs> he makes a bad choice. That's all. And everything else flows from that bad choice. And there's a reason he makes a bad choice. Kind of like what Sam suggested. He doesn't have enough information to make a proper decision. If he had known that the parents that he thinks are the ones he is destined to kill and sleep with and raise children from, if he had known they were his adopted He'd have gone, Phew. okay, I can stay here then. Because Merope and Polybus, his parents, they're not blood kin to me. So if I stay here, I won't kill them and marry them. 
Okay, kill him, marry her. So Sam then asks, I wonder what sort of a tale we've fallen into. What kind of story is this, Mr. Frodo? Is this the kind of story you want to be in if you're on the inside? Or is this the kind of story we would rather be on the outside looking in? Frodo, I wonder. But I don't know. I wonder, but I don't know. And that's the way of a real tale. <coughs> Take anyone that you're fond of. You may know or guess what kind of a tale it is, happy ending or sad ending, but the people in it don't know. Right? If it's a good story, and as Tolkien puts it in the fairy story essay, if it is written with art, if it's technically really good, the person in it doesn't know. Right? Think of the Harry Potter stories. How many of you have read them again? Show of hands. Quite a few. How many of you have seen any of the films? How many of you know the general story arc? Okay. I can still ask this. Anyway. Harry doesn't know the story, does he? Because, <laughs> I mean, we're not told till the end of book seven, but his very first question at the end of book one, so why was Voldemort after me? Can't answer that. Next question. Liar. Dumbledore can answer that. He just doesn't want to. He's afraid he's going to scare Harry. Well, I mean, he would. <laughs> <laughs> would it, though? Even Harry at 11? Probably not. Would it be better for Harry to know? I'm one of those who says, yes. Kids are, <laughs> kids are able to take an awful lot more than we think they are. Often when we are trying to protect them, what are we really doing? More harm as well. Okay, we're harming them, we're protecting ourselves. Okay, because we don't want to be the one to burst the illusions that children have about life. Though I do it all the time. <laughs> did with my own kids. So Frodo says, um, the people in it don't know. And you don't want them to know. Now, go back to Harry for a moment, because we're going to find out something in one of the books. What is it we, that we really don't want Harry to know? Do we don't want Harry to know that Lord Voldemort wants to kill him because of a prophecy? No. Who <laughs> gives a rat? What is it we don't want Harry to know? That he has to die. <laughs> he has to die. Well, hello, everybody knows you have to die. But do they really? Because for most of us, what do we think about that? It's way off in the future. For Harry, <laughs> in 2017, he's got to die. And so therefore, what must he do? He must learn to accept death. It's the overarching theme of the entire. In fact, it's not only he must learn to accept death, he must learn to die well. But you don't want Harry to know in his first year, Harry, we got to keep you alive. we got to keep you alive until you know enough, until you're trained enough, until you're smart enough, until you're wise enough that you can die at the right time. Like, right, right, right. <coughs> you know, step the throat. <laughs> As Snape actually said, so we're, we're kind of fattening up, and Dumbledore's like, oh, so you care. <laughs> okay? So, you don't want them to. Sam, no, of course not. Of course you don't want him to know. Bear, and he goes back to the tale of Baron and Luthien, which Aragorn told them partially, okay, on Weathertop. He never thought he was going to get that crown, that silver row from the Iron Crown. That is, he started the process, but Sam is telling us he thought he was on what? Fool's errand. I'm going to die. I'm going to die trying. Why? Because Luthien. She's a freaking goddess. Literally, half Maya, half seriously powerful elf, okay? And gorgeous. So she's worth it. But I'm going to die. There's no way I'm going to do this because I'm going to be Satan, okay? And within Tolkien's cosmology, again, Morgoth is literally the Satan figure, he is the opponent to 
Iru Iluvatar. He is the one who introduces evil darkness into the whole world. I shouldn't go here, but Tom Bombadil. Remember the little scene in the house of Tom Bombadil? They're sitting there, they had a bit to drink. I kind of imagine they're all smoking a little weed. Pipe weed, that is. <laughs> or whatever kind. And Tom talks to them, and Frodo kind of goes in and out of sleep. And Tom talks to them about the past. And he says, the eldest I am. And Tom, Because Frodo says, what? No, he doesn't say what. He says... Page 131. I don't have time for this. <laughs> Who are you? Frodo asked. Eh, what? Because he's old. He's hard of hearing. <laughs> don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. What the hell kind of answer is that? <clears throat> Tell me. Who are you? Alone. Yourself. Nameless. Think about that for a moment. Who are you? Who are you, Camille? Alone? Yourself? Huh? I just said Camille. Nameless. What does that mean? Are any of us, I mean, we can be alone, right? I am myself. I'm not somebody else. Nameless? No. Because we were all given a name, right? Why? Because everyone in here is dependent. What does that mean? What's a pendant? Something that hangs. We are dependent because we hang from something. None of us is independent. We all hang from something else. Literally, biologically, genetically, we hang from our parents. Blame from their parents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Nameless implies this idea. Independent. Not having a name. <clears throat> Tom's talking about himself there. Alone, himself, nameless. Okay? You are young and I am old. Well, how old? Eldest. <laughs> That's how old. Eld est. What's the est mean? Mostest. <laughs> Mostest eldest. He says, he doesn't say elder and he doesn't say old. Eldest. Well, who already that we spoke of, that we heard, described himself as the oldest living thing? Treebeard did. But Treebeard was made by the elves. Was Treebeard made by the elves? Or was he made by Yavanna, queen of the gods, who's the one responsible for all the green vegetative living stuff? Okay? Oh, he says he was awakened. Well, he was awakened. Yeah, he was awakened first. Okay? So he is the first of the living things awakened into sentience before the elves, right? So Treebird says that. Now Tom says, I'm the eldest. <clears throat> Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Now, that just means before the Brandewin River and before the trees in his little forest. Forests come and go. Rivers change their course. Okay? So, maybe he's a few thousand years old. Cool. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. <laughs> The first raindrop? Tom remembers when there wasn't any rain. <coughs> um, he made paths before the big people. That's elves and men. Okay. And saw the little people arriving. That's the hobbits and dwarves. Dwarves first. 
He was there before the kings and the graves and the Barrowites. That is, Tom was there before the men of Numenor came to the land. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already. That is, back when the world was flat. And they went from the land of what's called east of Beleriand, through Beleriand, to the shore, sailed across the ocean, and went to Valinor. He says, I was here before any of that happened. Notice you keep pushing time back. This is like going, you know, being an astrophysicist and looking at the red shift of stars and keep going back, back, hey, we're not at 13.1 billion, 13.2 billion, we're getting to 14.1 billion years. Before the seas were bent, he knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless. Before the dark Lord came from outside. When is that? That's before um, Melkor, his original name, who becomes Morgoth, that's before Melkor enters the world and leaves the presence of Eru Iluvatar, which is back at the beginning of the summer rain, beginning of creation. Okay? Melkor leaves because God, Eru Iluvatar, says, after he's kind of done this creation stuff where these angelic beings have sung all this stuff, he says, now let me show you what you just said, because it's all real. You just sang the whole history of the world. And he kind of cue up the video, and he plays the vision for them, and they see everything, and Melkor's like, I'm going to F that up that stuff. I'm going to mess that up. And he goes down into the what did Tom just tell us? I was here before that. Okay. So who is Tom? Jesus? I don't think he's Jesus. I, I think that might be close. <laughs> I think if anything, Tolkien's Catholicism and his cosmology, if anything, Tom might be a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, who, according to Genesis brooded on the face of the earth. Okay? I could be wrong. Go back, go forward now. So, he goes back to Baron. He did, that is, he got the Simmeril, and now was a worse place and a back, blacker danger than ours. He's kind of saying, come on, Mr. Frodo, suck it up. Could be worse. Could be worse. We could be in Satan's backyard, you know. But that's a long tale, of course, and goes on past the happiness and into grief and beyond. What's he mean, past the happiness? He gets the Silmaril. The wolf, I can't remember, Huan. Is that right? Or is Huan Baron's hound? That's Baron's hound. He gets the wolf. Um, the wolf bites his hand off. With the Silmaril in it. Okay? And they chase the wolf, and the wolf is killed and dies. In front of Thingol, Luthien's father, they slice it open, and there's Baron's hand with the Silmaril. Remember what the thing was? You got to bring me the Silmaril in your head. Only problem is, Baron dies. When would he write the Silmaril? When was he writing? <laughs> it begins in around 1915 and probably on his deathbed. So he was already leaving all of that before oh, the yeah. Lord of the Rings. Yeah. If you read the foreword to the Lord of the Rings, he talks about all this other stuff that he was working on. And he was working on all this other stuff for one simple reason. Tolkien was a language nut. Nut. I mean, absolute bonkers nut. And he was, you know, while he's... Shooting Germans in World War I, he was working on dictionaries of gnomish and elvish, etc. Okay? But he realized one thing. So off track. <laughs> he re no, it's okay. He realized one thing. Every language has what? An origin. Keep going. Louder. A culture. A culture. That is, people who speak it. 
And if people speak language, what do they tend to do with it? Early on, we know this historically. They tell stories. So he's creating languages. He's got to create people that speak those languages. And those people have to have a story. They have to have a history. And that's what essentially the Silmarillion is. It's the mythological background to all of Middle Earth. Okay? That's why when C.S. Lewis wrote his space trilogy, beginning in 1938, Lewis had a little footnote there. Right? Because he mentions in one of the books, in, in an introduction, he mentions, you know, anyone who would like to know more about Western Nessa must await much that remains only in the manuscripts of my friend J.R.R. Tolkien. Because Lewis brings in a character in the third book of the Space Trilogy that he says is ultimately from Western Nessa. That's Numenor. It's Merlin. He says Merlin was a Numenorian. Tolkien was not happy that Lewis did that, by the way. He's like, well, oh, that's it. Just put more pressure on me. To, you know. Because Tolkien hadn't even written The Lord of the Rings at that point. Nobody even knew what Western Nessa was. Because it's not even mentioned in the Western Nessa as a place. is isn't mentioned in the Hobbit. Right? So all this is background to here. Which is why, you know, I've got this up. The, the publication dates for the, the three volumes of The Lord of the Rings. I mean, people wanted to know immediately upon the publication of this. More! Well, Tolkien gives them a tidbit, like an hors d'oeuvre, with the appendices. But they're like, More! And Tolkien, you know, he has the temerity to go and die in 1973 <laughs> when he hadn't published The Silmarillion. His son, four years later, comes out with The Silmarillion. And then he starts coming out a couple of years after that with what gets called The History of Middle Earth, 12 volume of essentially all the scraps <laughs> that Tolkien left behind. And there's more that's not included. You can go to the Bodleian Library. If you get permission, you can go to the Bodleian Library and you can ask for the Tolkien manuscript, some of it, and have it brought out. And you're sitting there reading stuff and you're like, hey, where does that show up? Or his lectures, almost none of which have been published. And there's mounds. Of, I've looked at a ton of it. I'm like, his stuff on the history of the English language ought to be published. And nobody's doing it. Go away. Go away. Okay? So, back to where we were. How much time do we have? 25 minutes. So, he says, it goes on past the happiness, into grief, put barren dies, and beyond. Baron is allowed to come back. So he and Luthien can marry. Right? But then what's going to happen? Because if you're human, what's going to happen? Oh, you got to die. Okay? There it is again. You got to die. Luthien is immortal. She's half goddess. She doesn't have to die. She chooses to. She makes a decision. I will become mortal. That is, I will die. Doesn't necessarily mean she's going to die with him. Like, you know, they're both in the plane when the plane crashes. But she will die. And. He will die, and when he dies, he will be allowed to go off to Mandos, and she will be allowed to join him. And then they will go off to wherever, because we're not even told where humans go. You have to read the book called The Lost Road and Other Writings that tells us where humanity gets to go. Okay, So that's what Sam is kind of aware of. He's aware of the general story, Into Grief and Beyond It. And the Silmaril, that is the Silmaril that Baron took for Morgoth's crown, becomes or comes to the hand of Erendil. Okay? Back up for just a moment to Council of Elrond. Calabria, we go south. Elrond says, in response to P. 
page 243. Frodo says, <coughs> in response to Elrond talking about being there at the Battle of Daggerland, notice now where we are, Frodo has kind of done what? He's, he's picked off on the bucket list. Uh, Daggerland Plains, where Elrond fought several thousand years ago. Been there, done that, don't want to go back. So Elrond tells him, my mother was, we'll put Elrond down here. My mother was Elwing. Okay. Erendil was my sire. Ear and Dill, or A-R and Dill, as it should be pronounced. People get on YouTube and go, you're not pronouncing the names right. Shut the fuck up. Um, was my sire, who was born in Gondolin before its fall. My mother was Elwing, daughter of Dior. Okay. Son of Luthien and Baron. Mom. Grandfather, great. Grandfather and grandmother. Okay, okay. Arendel, um, no, sorry. Arendel is half. Take that back. No, he's not. He's fully elf. Okay. So this is why he's half elf. Because he's half elf on this side. Okay. He's half man on this side. Oh, right, it's that I'm speaking. Okay, so where was I? And so he mentions Arendil. Well, who is Arendil? What did Arendil do? Arendil took in a previous battle, previous time frame. Okay. Hold on, do I have that right? In, a, uh, in the first age of men, Arundel took that Silmaril, okay, that he got from Baron, got in a boat. This is after the world's been shaped, sh the uh, world's been changed, or, yeah, I think it is. And he gets in a boat, and he tries to sail over to Valinor. And they're like, no, 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 you can't come, you can't come, you can't come. But they finally let him in. And he tells them, he tells the gods of Valinor, if you guys don't help, man, we're screwed. We're totally screwed. Okay? So the gods do help. This is this is not the battle that Elrond is talking about outside Mordor. This is against Morgoth. Okay? And the gods help. They leave Valinor, they come, they kick, you know who's, you know what? They bind him in chains, etc. And they take Arendil and they apotheosize him. They make him into a godlike being. But he becomes a star. And the name Arendil comes from I can't remember the first word. Oh, there it is. Ayala Arendil, which is a half line of an old English poem. It's called an Advent poem. It's about the coming of Christ. And it just means, lo, the evening star. That line right there, that becomes the foundation of all of Tolkien's writing. It was that one half line that made him start by writing a little poem about this. And this becomes not a star, but it becomes a person. Okay, So that star, Arendil, as it's now called, where have we seen that before? Back in the mirror of Galadriel. She takes Frodo and Sam. She goes to the bird, the bird fountain, you know, the water fountain. She says, look in it. Don't touch it. Sam sees a bunch of things. He wants to run back. She tells him, you can't. You didn't want to run back before you saw. He says, you're right. Damn it. You're right. I'm going to stick it through. I'll go back the long way or I won't go back at all. But if I do ever go back, that Tim Saney man, he is going to pay because what is he seeing? He sees his father kicked out of his house, walking down Bagshot Row with all his belongings in a wheelbarrow. 
Okay? What is Frodo see? Frodo sees a whole bunch of stuff. And then Frodo proceeds to eye of Sauron, and then what does he realize? He looks at Galadriel, and she has a ring on her finger, and he says, I perceive <laughs> that's one of the rings. You have one of the three elder rings. She says, you can see that because you have the ring. And I see what you just saw. I always see that. I always see that guy. And she holds her hands up because Frodo says, what to her? Yeah. You are wise and powerful and pretty hot and beautiful. <laughs> Will you not take the ring? And she's like, oh, for <laughs> she thought Sam was nice. Instead of a dark lord, you will have a dark lady. And I will be beautiful and fear, and all will bow down and worship. I mean, that's a command, by the way. She's not saying everybody's going to go, oh, man, you're so beautiful. No, they will bow down. Okay? And she holds her hands up, and Frodo realizes. That's when he realizes the whole thing about the ring. And she explains about the Star of Erendil there. Okay? She gives him the file later on when she's handing out gifts. And the file is what? It's got water from the mirror that the water contains what? The light of the star. Okay? So, and why, sir? I never thought of that before. We've got some of the light of it, Arendelle, in that star glass that the lady gave you. Why? And it... We're in the same story. Don't the stories ever end? Don't the great tales never end? Frodo, no, they don't. And if you read the fairy story, I say, what does Tolkien, what's, he, what's the real point he's getting at? All tales, all stories are related. Why? Because they're all echoes. They're all shadows of the one real true story okay? that he says in the epilogue, it's the Christian story. It's the story that he told C.S. Lewis on an evening in September 1931, 1930 or so, that if there, was, there was never a story that people would more, most wish to be true than the Christian story. That is, it's myth, as Lewis puts it later, myth became fact. See, Lewis couldn't accept Christianity because there's all kinds of stories about dying gods, etc. And Tolkien and another friend go for a walk with him and they talk about all this stuff. And Lewis starts off on that walk. He's a theist. He believes in God now. He had been card-carrying atheist before, but now he believes in God and he walks away and within a couple weeks he's gone from theism to Christianity because he says it's myth, it's true. Well, that's kind of what Sam is coming to this realization. These old stories, they're true. What kind of truth? They're like that little sliver of white light. Because what can I, what could we do? If I were to bring in a big old prism right here and shine a pretty powerful narrow beam of white light through it, what would you see on that back wall? Rangy biv. Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet. Why? It's white light that is shattered. Right? Tolkien says all stories and ultimately all people are bits of splintered light. And the light is God, ultimately. Right? That's why when he has the conversation with Saruman, when Gandalf has that conversation with Saruman, and Saruman says something white. I'm Saruman of many colors. What's he implying there? The light has been shattered. And Gandalf says, I like white better. Why? Because the white is whole. The white is complete. You get yellow from the white, and you've taken the white apart. Which is why Gandalf says, he who would take something apart to find out what it is, has left the path of wisdom. Which is why I hate, it's not too strong a term, how English courses are usually taught, literature courses. Because what are, what are students often taught to do? Take it apart. Anal what does analyze mean? Break it down into its components. You break it down into its components, and what do you have? Words. That's it. No relation to each other. 
So Tolkien in the essay on fairy stories uses the image of what this is. It's like a stew. You put a whole bunch of ingredients in a pot, you turn on the heat, you let it cook for a while. It all cooks together. So if I told you we're going to have, you know, don't eat that morning, come to class, and I'm going to bring stew for you, and you came in, and I've got sitting on these two desks, pot of water, salt, pepper, carrots, onion, potatoes, celery maybe, some spices, and a chunk of meat. Dig in. You're going to go, show me what the hell's going on with you. It's not stew. Those are the ingredients. So you take the story apart, and you're left with the ingredients. That's what a lot of people do with the Lord of the Rings. They try to figure out all of Tolkien's sources. There's a ton of them. But then, once you do that, what are you left with? The sources. It's what Tolkien does with the sources. It's like I tell my Shakespeare students. Shakespeare didn't have an original idea. None of his plays are original to him. He's taken plots, themes, characters, plays from other people, and he changes them. He adds characters, he removes characters, he takes history, and he expands time, he expresses, you know, condenses time. That is his genius. Okay? But if you take the sort, take it and just look at the source material, you go, eh, hey, so what? Okay? Sam. Do the great tales never end? No, they never end as tales, says Frodo, but the people in them come and go with their parts in it, right? Because Bor uh, Boromir, Boromir is no longer around. Baron and Luthien are no longer around. Gloin might still be around back in the you know, land of the dwarves. <clears throat> Frodo, our part will end later, period? No, or sooner. Why does he throw in the or sooner? Is it because he doesn't know? I, I think Frodo's pretty much given in to despair at this point. I could be wrong. It might but just be he's edging his back. Eh, we don't know how it's going to end. But by ending with, late, with sooner, usually you put the most important thing at the end. You, you want that to be what people... Have in their minds when they, or sooner kind of implies, better get a move on, Sam, because we don't have much time left. Okay? Sam, and then we can have some rest and sleep. It's like Sam is totally oblivious to what Frodo has just said. Rest and sleep implies what? We get to go home. We get to go home. And that is not what Frodo means. Cut to the end of the novel. The very, I mean, literally, the very end, the last page, the last paragraph. Sam goes home. And as he makes his way home, he looks up Bag Shop Row and he sees number four, Bag Inn, what had been Frodo's house, now his house, his hole, and there's a warm light shining inside and the door is open. Like somebody said, Rosie, get the house ready. He's on his way. And he goes in, and we're told she draws him in. It's like she is waiting at the door, and she pulls him in. She puts him down. She sets him in his favorite chair, we're told. Like he's got this big old stuffed easy boy, lazy boy. And she puts his daughter in his lap. And his final words, well, I'm back. That's how it ends. Why? Sam gets the kind of happy ending story for the person inside the story. Frodo doesn't. Frodo doesn't get that kind of happy ending. Frodo gets another kind of happy ending. Frodo gets to go off and be with the elves <laughs> and the gods. And a little, you know, thing stolen from the appendices. So does Sam later on. Sam will also go off, ultimately, to Valinor for one simple reason. We haven't seen it yet, so I'm not going to say it. So, they fall asleep. They wonder, before they fall asleep, they wonder, what kind of character is Gollum? Is he a hero? Is he a villain? What does he think he is? Okay. 
And we're told, bottom of 713, uh, Frago says, I think he really is in part trying to save the precious from the enemy. <coughs> Notice, and I don't think I've ever noticed that before, or I've ever pointed it out. Notice what, Sam, what Frodo calls the ring. The precious. Usually when Frodo refers to the ring, he calls it the ring. He's using Gollum's language. As long as he can. Okay? And then Sam calls Gollum slinker and stinker. Okay? They fall asleep. Notice Sam's not supposed to fall asleep. He tells Frodo, I'll keep watch. So... Sam leans down, back against the wall, legs out in front of him. Frodo lays down beside him with his head in Sam's lap. Sam puts one hand on Frodo's kind of forehead and one hand on Frodo's chest. For the simple reason, he moves, I'm going to wake up. Okay? Some people have said this is homoerotic. No, no. Okay? And look at what we're told. Page 714. I think we have time for this. And so Gollum found them hours later, when he returned, crawling and creeping down the path out of the gloom ahead. Sam sat propped against the stone, his head drooping, dropping sideways, his breathing heavy. In his lap <coughs> lay Frodo's head, drowned deep in sleep. Upon his white forehead lay one of Sam's brown hands, and the other lay softly upon his master's breast. Peace was in both their faces. <sighs> A sweet, you know, not quite sleep of death, but the, quit, the, the sweet peace of sleep and, and just being dead to the world. Look at the next paragraph. I mean, this is so important. Gollum looked at them. A strange expression passed over his lean, hungry face. The gleam faded from his eyes, and they went dim and gray, old and tired. A spasm of pain seemed to twist him, and he turned away, peering back up towards the pass, shaking his head, as if in engaged in some interior debate. Well, let's assume he is engaged in some interior debate. What is that interior debate? Should I go through with it? Should I lead them to their capture? <coughs> Then he came back and slowly puts out a trembling hand. Very cautiously, he touched Frodo's knee, but almost the touch was a caress. For a fleeting moment, could one of the sleepers have seen him? <coughs> they would have thought that they beheld an old, weary hobbit, shrunken by the years that had carried him far beyond his time, beyond friends and kin and the fields and streams of youth, an old, starved, pitiable thing. Notice, the narrator tells us this is what they would have seen. And what, what's the description of? A hobbit. Old, starved, pitiable. What is Gollum doing when he reaches out and touches Frodo on the knee? Why does he touch him on the knee? Why doesn't he touch him on the foot? Why not on the arm? Why not on the hip? Why not on the chest? Why not on the head? Why the knee, specifically? It's very important classically, classically and biblically speaking, okay? In the Old Testament, when you sought the blessing of someone, like when old Jacob is blind and he's on his deathbed and his, um, sorry, Joseph is blind and he's on his deathbed, no, Jacob, he's blind and Joseph brings his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, to be blessed, right? They put their hands on his knees for blessing. Other points in scripture, we see people clasping somebody around the knees in the Aeneid by Virgil. We see a character, I'm pretty sure it's Turnus, who appeals to Aeneas, the founder of Rome, right? Ultimately, the founder of Rome who appeals to Aeneas for mercy. And he does it by clasping, clasping around his knees. And he literally begs for mercy. And Aeneas goes, no, I don't think so. You know, and kills him. Right? 
What Gollum's doing here, it's an appeal. It's wordless. But it is indicating a couple of things. He is in Frodo's power, and Frodo can grant him real mercy. What would that mercy be? Look at the description again. Gollum is what? Old, pitiable, alone, forlorn. Welcome home. Frodo, we're almost being told, could have the ability, the ability to redeem Gollum back into the community of hobbithood. And what happens? Frodo stirs. Sam wakes up. And what does Sam say? He sees him pawing at Master. Hey, what are you up to? Nothing, nothing. <coughs> nice, Master. Notice, Gollum says this softly. He doesn't respond in the same way that Sam speaks. I dare say, but where have you been to? <coughs> Sneaking off and back, you old villain. Old villain, that's like you archetypal villain. You old Satan. You old adversary. Like, man, are we never going to be rid of you? Now look at Gollum. Gollum withdrew himself. And a green glint flickered under his heavy lids. Now what have I said before about when somebody's eyes glint? That's always evil. This time, they're green. Have you ever heard about somebody being something with envy? Green. In, um, in the Chronicles of Prydain, if you're ever fam familiar with those, there is a character who we're told has the green-eyed monster on his back. It's the monster of jealousy and envy. Almost spider-like he looked now. Why? Well, how did he look when he first came? We first saw him coming down the face of the cliffs. Spider-like. Why else? Foreshadowing. Little tiny version of the great big mama who's just waiting. So... That's gone shot, and it's gone. Because of Sam's reaction. So we get Shelob's lair. What happens in Shelob's lair? And do I have time? 51 seconds. <laughs> Before the quiz. What happens at Shelob's lair? They get attacked, right? Who's Shelob? Uh, spider lady. As one of my sisters would say, her worst nightmare. <laughs> she hates spiders. Shelob would be, think of a tarantula, about as big as his room. So the legs touch, you know, when they're outside, they touch the, where the wall in the corners be. And the body's right here, and probably, yeah, probably the length of, you know, this part of the lights. It'd probably be about that wide. Okay. Scary as all, you know. It's okay to be like Ron and put skates on her. <laughs> yeah, you could, you know, do a ridiculous charm and make her go away. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up. Shut up. Stop. Stop. Okay, so, you know, we'll never finish Lord of the Rings. We'll pick this up. <laughs> you know, I, I put this at the beginning of book six. I thought we'd get a little bit farther. So, put everything away so I can give you a quiz.